He would take the breast of his mother only on Wednesdays and Fridays <laughs> to show his Catholic followers the proper art of fasting. Of course, the Catholics, they added some more days in there. They're not about just to eat on two days a week. It's like go without food on two days a week. They just swapped it around. But that was to show the, the pure art of fasting. He refused his mother's breast except on Wednesdays and Fridays. Now, on his feast night, which was December the 6th, now remember, at, at this time, whenever, uh, whenever we're talking about, let's, well, let's go back to the Philokalian calendar from the chronographer of 354 and 336 A.D. Whenever we're talking about that time, we're talking about Saul Invictus as it was spiritually incorporated into the church as Christmas, the Mass for Christ, the celebration of his birthday. There's no such thing as Santa Claus during this time. That doesn't come on the scene until later. So St. Nicholas doesn't have anything to do with the Feast of Christmas until the Catholics begin to get some things, invent some things, and spiritualize some other things, and work St. Nicholas or Santa Claus into the Christmas celebration. So anyway, on his feast night, which was December the 6th, he left cookies and cakes in the shoes of good little children. Remember the little saying, you better be good? You ever thought about that before? That's Catholicism. You better be good. It's the, you don't have any faith involved in this. The blood of Jesus. His worthiness. Your worthiness through his worthiness. No. It's you better be good. You don't better not be bad. Better not tell any lies in your life. Santa Claus, he's watching you. He knows what you're doing. That's old Catholicism. It's your good works that give you things. It's your good works that bring things into your possession. Now, at this time, he is, according to the ancient pictures that we have of him, a kindly, thin, young little man. So how did the fat, jelly-bellied lie image come into it? Well, the Dutch settlers of New Amsterdam, which is New York City, made him into the magician that he now is by drawing some associations from the alleged miracles surrounding the birth and life of St. Nicholas. You can study up on his life, and his life was just full of all types of miracles, one right after the other. And so they drew a parallel between that and what they wanted to have, which was magic around this time of year. And so they're the ones who made him into the magician that he now is, just before the turn of this century. Then the cartoon strips and stories picked up what the Dutch people had set forth whenever they came and settled in certain areas of New York City, the beginning of this century. And as, as they picked it up, he shortly assumed the fat-bellied, red suit, white-bearded appearance. In other words, we're talking about something that is strictly an American invention. St. Nicholas was a thin, shaven, kindly little fella, according to the pictures that we have of him uh, many centuries ago. So you have to ask the question, where did this bewhiskered clown dressed like a dunce come in then? Where did, where did this fat, jelly-bellied man dressed in red leotard smoking a pipe, where did he come into all this? That's not even found in the history of the celebration of Christmas. It's not even found in even the legendary historical accounts, which aren't true of this St. Nicholas of Catholicism in, in Europe. It's not even found there. It wasn't invented until the Dutch came over and settled in a certain part of New York, and it's virtually impossible, by the way, to trace back this specifically and find out now where did he first appear. You know how things slowly evolve over a period of time. He'd get picked up in a cartoon strip by someone in that area that these Dutch people, you know, they pick up an idea, these Dutch people have this funny fella. It's a St. Nicholas of the Christians over in Europe, but yet they've got him now with a big belly. They've got him now dressed in a red suit. And they would pick that up and draw a picture, and then pretty soon someone else would see that. That's how things have come up like using the term the Iron Curtain. That was used... Uh, by Churchill in a speech in Missouri, in Fulton, Missouri, back many decades ago that he used in a speech that a newspaper reporter picked up, and since that time, everybody knows what the term Iron Curtain means. Just because someone uses something at one time and it's picked up by somebody in the media, 
begins to spread like wildfire. We're talking only about 80 years ago. There is no such thing as this fat fella that we associate with Christmas today. That he finally evolved, came on the scene, and over the period of the next few years, by means of the comic strips and stories and cartoons, he was just spread abroad everywhere. Right out of media capital, which is New York at that time. You don't have a city like New York at the beginning of this century here in this country because that's where all of the immigrants are coming over. That's where you always land the Statue of Liberty there. Give me your homeless. Give me your poor. And I'll deceive them like you were going to if they would have stayed there. So they welcome everyone to come in. And that's about where they land. And so that's what takes place. Now, because the Feast of St. Nicholas was in December, was on December the 6th, then the Catholic people picked him up as being a good fella to be the antithesis to Jesus Christ, because you have to get him out of the picture, to be the one that the whole holiday is going to center around. Now, they didn't center it around the fat-bellied lie that we have today, because he wasn't fat, but it was the legendary character known as St. Nicholas. And so his feast day, being in the wintertime, obviously associates him with cold, which sooner or later brought about legends of the reindeer and the North Pole and different things like this. Again, I have to say it's impossible to isolate exactly where and when and how all of this came about, the North Pole and reindeer and things like this, but uh, these statistics that we are giving you give us a good idea. And so we've got from this, this Catholic version of the St. Nicholas by means of the Dutch settlers of New York, then we end up with the fellow dressed in red, smoking a pipe with a cap on, with a big white beard, who laughs ho, 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 and who slides down the chimney. Remember, on the feast of St. Nicholas, December the 6th, it was said according to legend that he left cookies and cakes in the shoes of good little children. And so over a process of time, that just evolved into the children turning around and leaving him the cookies and the cake to eat at night and him leaving them presents. You're working your way up. We've got to get more than food out of this fat fella. Let's get gifts out of it. So the children ended up leaving the, the, the cakes, the candies, the cookies. You know, your mom would bake some chocolate chip cookies and you'd put them there on a platter and a little glass of milk and yeah. next morning they're gone. But we down south don't have chimneys, though. I never figured out how we got down. Sent through the bathroom vent pipe, and that'd really be a miracle to squeeze down through that. But you can see how all of this just began to snowball, and stories told about the fat fella stuck in <laughs> the fat fella stuck in the chimney, and all types of things just began to evolve. One right after another, it just became a snowball effect. Until in just 80 short years, you know what it's done. It's taken over the imagination of the whole world now. Right, right, right. And people think this has been going on forever. And this is a purely American invention. We're talking about this bewhiskered clown that's dressed like a dunce. That nobody could trust just from the way he laughs. He sounds deceptive the way that he laughs. In the apocryphal book of Bell and Dragon, it's interesting that we see the leaving of the food for gods there, which shows us that this idea came right, right out of demonism, right out of Satanism. That's found right in the Catholic apocryphal books, where they left some little goodies for their god, and he ate them the, during the night before they came back the next morning. That's right in the Catholic Bible. So it's no wonder they get these things over to their real religious experience when they've got basis for all of that. There is a town in, in Indiana who back in 1846 wanted to name itself Santa Fe, which means the holy faith of St. Francis of Assisi. They found out that someone had beat him to the name, and so they took the name Santa Claus. And down to this day, the post office in Santa Claus, Indiana, gets one million letters around that time of year that they have to somehow do something with in order to appease and satisfy all the children that send these things to them. One million letters. How would you like to live in the town of Santa Claus, Santa Claus, Indiana? It's interesting that old St. Nick is the patron saint of the country of Russia. He's the patron saint of Russia. You know, you've got different wow. saints that are the patron saint of a certain city or a certain country. 
And he's the Catholic, the European Catholic patron saint of, anybody want to guess? What's he, what's St. Nicholas the patron saint of? Beer drinkers. St. Nicholas is the patron saint of beer drinkers. Oh. Well, you see all the connections, how all of this came about then. Oh, yeah. It ends up being a mystery to you on how anybody ever adopted all of these things. But Christians lied to their children. I was raised in a professedly Christian home, and I was told lies by my parents. We're talking about this particular time of year. Whenever it comes around, people just think everything's justified. A nip on the old bottle's justified now. Overeating is justified. Lying becomes justified at this time of year. Oh, it, it won't hurt. It won't hurt. A lie is a lie. Amen. And not only that, we had him down in junior fellowship hall sitting on a chair and we sat up in his lap at church. Yeah. Yeah, amen. The church told us a lie. You go to your average mall or department store around this time of year and they're telling you a lie. You go into a good full customer service bank and they're telling you a lie. Right. The whole world's lying to children about this fat man who couldn't be in 10 million places all at the same time, Amen. who doesn't even exist. That's right. And I wonder if you'll turn over to Revelation 21 to show you how serious it is. Oh, he's the greatest one. No one, do you realize I don't remember a time whenever we celebrated Christmas as a Christian religious church going family that we ever got down on our knees and thanked God for sending his son into the world. We never once did that. I don't remember a time of doing that. We did nothing but celebrate this fat, jelly-bellied lie. Amen. And the church even promoted that. Right, yeah. The little plays that we had ended up being little Christmas plays about Santa Claus. Yeah. And I don't remember a time of ever thinking about Jesus Christ Amen. during that time of year. You're too busy caught up in self Amen. and in presence and in Santa Claus during this time of year. Amen. Because everybody is telling you a lie about him when he doesn't even exist. That's right. So that's something very, very serious. Revelation 21 and verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All liars. You cannot excuse your lie of Santa Claus due to it coming on the 25th of December. There's no excuse for that. And you need to enlighten your children the fact that this is a demon incarnate. It's what it is. It's a lie of Satan incarnate that you see at schools, that you see at church, that your own relatives will try to lie to you about and then criticize your form of Christianity when they don't live theirs. The Bible says don't bear false witness. That's a false witness to tell little unsuspecting gullible children that this fat man is the God who blesses them with all of these good things on Christmas morning. It's blasphemy is what it is. Amen. When you tell them that if they'll be good, then old Saint Nick will bring these things to them. I was told that in a Christian home. In a Christian home, not an atheistic home where we hated God. In a good church-going Christian home. That this was a good man. Oh, I remember sitting up with my sisters on, on Christmas Eve, looking out the window, looking for that sleigh in the sky. And I believed it with all my heart. On the radio, they'll tell you about, oh, he's been spotted now. They'll tell you on the radio when he's been spotted. And the little children won't run to the window and look out and try to find the sleigh and the reindeer and old St. Nick cracking the whip over them. We spent hours looking for him in the sky. What an abomination in the eyes of God to lie to your children about things like this and have any connection at all with Jesus Christ. Well, I trust you see how horrible the pagan holiday is. I wouldn't let a child come within 10 feet of the fat jelly belly line. And if you just get bold enough, go yank the beard off and show him this is the garbage man. You've seen him before out front of the house. Yeah. This isn't Santa Claus. He doesn't exist. And let him know what a lie that is. This man doesn't, there's no such thing as that. 
You need to enlighten them in a hurry to this fact. We're getting around that time of year. Don't participate in any of that. It's idolatry. It's demonism. It is a worship of Satan. Anything that involves a lie, the Bible says anyone who loves and makes a lie is the Antichrist. He's the Antichrist Amen. who loves and makes a lie. And we're told here in Revelation 21 and verse 8 that all liars will have their part in the lake of fire and brimstone, which burns Amen. forever and ever. That's right. Amen. To deceive these precious children who don't know any better but to trust their parents. And then you wonder why they revolt later on in life when you've lied to them all your life about Easter bunnies and Santa Clauses. Right. And then you also wonder about what they're going to think about your concern and love for them when they, whenever they're maybe six or seven years of age, find out the truth about it and it just breaks their heart. Amen. They've been led to believe this all of their life, that this good man really does exist and he lives way up at the North Pole and he works with little tiny men called elves. And, and Mrs. Santa Claus works up there. And they all are fat and ugly up there. And then the child finds out they don't exist. And they generally find out through someone besides their parents. What are they going to think of you? You lied to them and they had to have a friend or a teacher at school tell them that Santa Claus doesn't exist. If anybody should tell them, it should be the parent. Amen. But then you've got to confess you've been wrong all your life. Amen. I was never told by my parents these things did not exist. I just found out. I don't remember how, but you hear about it somewhere. And I'm talking to a lot of grown adults out there. You think all this is nonsense. You think when you were four and five years old, you believed in that with all of your heart. Amen. No one could convince you Santa Claus didn't exist. No one even tried to. You didn't want to hear anything but the lie that he really did exist. Amen. Oh, God is going to judge the church, the church, for putting this over on the whole world, this religious abomination of a festival and holiday. With this lie of Santa Claus, God is going to judge the church. You can see the devil getting into the church. He started by trying to spiritualize another day, and then we'll still talk about it being the birth of Christ. Then later on, they had to associate with the Feast of Saturnalia, things to eat, things to drink, and all of this. You see, it was, it was a progression where the devil worked his way in. And up until this century, nobody knew of old fat Saint Nick. Oh, there was, there was the skinny Saint Nick, but not the old fat Saint Nick that's so ubiquitous everywhere today. And now the devil has worked Santa Claus in to be a in direct opposition to Jesus Christ. The one figure most associated with the birthday of Christ is not Jesus, Amen. but it's Santa Claus. So I wouldn't spend two seconds apologizing to anybody for anything about my position concerning the holiday. Amen. I'd let them know in a hurry, regardless of who they are, that's demonism. That is a worship of Satan. Anything that's a lie is Antichrist. And we know who the father of all lies is. Amen. 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 John 8, 44. He's the father of all liars. And yet we've got ministers that stand up in their little sermons in order to excite the ears and the hearts of the children and tell them little filthy lies about old Saint Nick. And parents who profess to be good, upright, religious, church-going, ethically-minded, moral individuals who lie to their children. I don't care what anybody thinks about that. I don't care what some of my past relatives thought about it. I was lied to. Amen. And God doesn't take that very lightly. And I don't appreciate that. Amen. Being lied to. So our children know otherwise. And more than just knowing otherwise, they're going to know adamantly otherwise. That I hate that because that is Satan dressed up in that red suit that's kind of like the red devil with the forked tail and the pitchfork in his hand. Yeah. It's all red. They all go together. They're all going to burn in hell together. Yeah. Because the, the lie came right out of the pit of hell. And I don't think of any strong reverse in Revelation 21.8 yeah. to say what's going to happen to those people that continue telling lies. What are you going to do? When you're confronted with Jesus Christ and he asks you, why did you lie to people about my birthday? I wasn't born in the wintertime. I know when I was born. 
Why are you gonna, what are you going to do when he asks you questions like that? What are you going to do when he asks you, why did you lie to your children about this fat man that never did exist? Purely legendary in character. It's one thing to be a Francis of Assisi who really did exist, an Augustine who really did exist. It's another thing to be a purely legendary character who jumped up in his bath and praised God the day he was born for bringing in such a good boy into the world and only taking his mother's breast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Purely legendary character. There's nobody in their right mind who believes that this Saint Nicholas ever did exist. There are a lot of other saints that have a historical basis in the past for really existing. But of all of them to pick, you picked one who you know yourself is purely the invention of someone's fertile demonic imagination. And of all, thing, of all things, he's the patron of beer drinkers. That's what you do on that day. You follow after the God it is that you're worshiping. You let those deceived charismatics who want to celebrate the holiday anyway know otherwise that it's the spirit of Antichrist working in them. It's the spirit of Antichrist working through them to be involved in it. I don't know of any charismatic churches who have given up the holidays. I preached in some who I know didn't give them up because they were going on in the, in the school, in the church right there, who never gave up the holidays. Who might say, well, we won't tell them about Santa Claus anymore, but after all, it's still Jesus' birthday. That's what I heard. They had the truth enough not to lie to their children about Santa Claus, but yet they, they're going to tell us, well, we can't tell our children that, you know, you can't participate in these things. Whenever you're at school and whenever you go to the shopping center and there's a big thing, a big platform like a papal throne set up there with old St. Nick up on, and surely... It would be okay with God as long as I told my child that he really didn't exist, <laughs> which is a contradiction. What's he sitting there for then? If he's six years old to go ahead and hop up in his lap and, and do what? They make him out to be the all-knowing God. How can he remember everybody's request? I never saw him take a note down of anything. He just all of a sudden is an all-knowing, all-wise God who just remembers everything. What are you supposed to do? Get up in his lap and whisper in his ear how good you've been, how good you've been. The first thing you've got to tell, he'll ask you, have you been a good boy? Have you been a good girl? That's works religion came right out of Catholicism. And once you say, yes, I've been a good boy, you lie to him, then he'll lie to you. Yeah. You just trade off lies. Yes, I've been a good boy. Then what do you want? You'll tell him about that big train or that new Cabbage Patch doll you want. Maybe the, the priest will be sitting in his lap wanting the Cabbage Patch doll. And everybody wants a Cabbage Patch doll today. <laughs> Just go out and get a cabbage out of the patch. And there's your Cabbage Patch doll. <laughs> you can't even buy one of the things today. They're like a collector's item now. Yeah. The goofiest little kids I've ever seen before. Yeah. Worse than a G.I. Joe or Barbie. Yeah. They at least look real, but not these little cabbage patch kids, little demonic creatures. That's what they are. They're little demons drawn up by somebody. Never seen such a perverted little kid before than a cabbage patch kid. But anyway, they'll hop up in his lap and tell him this is what they want. And old St. Nick will tell them that's, that's what I'll get you. And somehow mom and dad's got to find out about that so they can go and get it. So the child thinks that Santa Claus did that for him. And you know as well as I do, children can't think fast enough to leave the bank where they just got in Santa Claus's lap and they go with their mother to the shopping center and there he is again there and wonder, now how did that fella get over here so fast? Children can't think like that. You see, parents, we as parents just let them into all types of deception by just going from the bank and then going over to the shopping center and then you're at church that night and there he was again at church. And the child never, he doesn't have the mental faculties to sit down and say, all right, who's this pulling the wool over my eyes? Santa Claus is popping up everywhere I go. He doesn't think of things like that. He just lovingly and trustingly falls into the lies of his parents. Oh, it's just so horrible. It's so horrible to think of. That your children, with all of their heart, their trust, and their love, no, I'm not trying to be melodramatic. This is the literal truth fall right into the snares of their own parents, the lying snares of their own parents. Well, praise God. Some of us are young enough we've never taught our children otherwise. If you have apologized to them, if you're ever lying to them in the past, 
And don't lie to them anymore about these things. Don't lie to your grandchildren about these things. Set them straight right away that this is a lie. The church is a lie. The church is a propagator of lies and a false witness by letting her members, her little members, that Jesus said, if you offend one of them, you know what it says. If you offend one of them, it'd be better that a millstone were hanged about around your neck and you were cast into the depth of the sea. For offending one of these little ones that trust in him just breaks your heart. We're getting to the serious point of all of this tonight. He said it'd be better that you drown yourself than do something that's unscriptural, Matthew chapter 18, to one of these little children that belong to me. You just grow up trusting in your pastor, the man of the cloak, the holy man of God, and yet who tells you lies about doctors, who tells you lies about Santa Claus, who tells you lies about everything. And then you, and then charismatics wonder, why can't we get people in our church, get them to settle down? They don't want to go to church. They're fearful of church. Charismatics are getting misled out there about just about everything. They wonder, what's the problem with the church? What's the problem? Why can't, in other words, we get people to submit to authority without going to the extremes of shepherdship? Why can't we get people to submit to authority? It's because people don't trust authoritarian figures anymore. They've lied to them too many times. Your pastor lied to you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He lied to you about divine healing. He lied to you about speaking in tongues. He lied to you about all these things. And then you get the baptism. You get speaking in tongues. You get divine healing. And then it's hard ever to trust a minister again. Amen. When all ministers, if one person told you a lie in your life, it was a minister. It was a man of the cloak that told Amen. you your lies. That's right. Other people didn't tell you lies. They just followed along what their ministers told them. They weren't the inventors of the lies. Your next door neighbor wasn't the one that lied to you. He told you a lie because he heard that lie from his minister at church. And so the whole church ends up being led by Nimrod, the rebellious one, and being named Babel, the church of confusion. Amen. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, the God of the Bible is not the God of your church then because he's not the God of confusion but of peace as in all the assemblies of the saints. He's not the God of denominationalism that wants to confuse us about all of these medieval mystical ideas about Santa Claus, about Saul and Victus, about the giving of gifts, about whining and dining, about merrymaking, about everything that doesn't have anything to do with Jesus Christ. You see, in all of this, I'm still searching for Jesus. You don't find him under the Christmas tree. You don't find him in the sleigh. You don't find him anywhere. You don't find him at church. Santa Claus greets you when you go in. I'm still looking for the one that the day is all about. And the one day you don't hear anything about him is that day. You hear a lot about Santa Claus. You hear a lot about yourself. You hear a lot about the presents and the trees and the carols and the food and the wine and the drinks. But that's the one day you don't hear anything about him. No, if it's Christ's birthday, why not devote the whole day to him rather than to self. Amen. If it's his birthday, why not bring presents to him in some way? At least take it to your local church or synagogue instead of taking them to one another. It's just a selfish indulgence Amen. to want to be pampered, to want to be given all of these things whenever at the same time you hope that no one will expect you to give too much to them. You're always looking for the cheap bargain to buy someone else. But boy, are you mad when someone buys you one of those cheap bargains. You don't want the albatross hung around your neck or the white elephant. You don't want something that's not needed. You'd like something good. Yet I hardly remember buying anybody anything that was good. Like I said, my father always got socks or a tie or handkerchief, something like that. A mother got a spatula for the kitchen or a new bowl or a new dish. And then it was the children that got all of these great toys and these big monstrosities of items that, if anything, should have gone to the parents for working so hard to raise the children instead of the children to spoil them the rest of their life with all of this worthless junk that they don't even need. I had a box filled with junk. We called it my toy box. My toy box was filled with junk. Just filled. Because Christmas after Christmas after Christmas just filled up with worthless items. 
it's one thing to get them a baseball bat and a glove or to get them something that they're really going to go outside and use or a bicycle. Then to get them, and you look in your average catalog, you can hardly find something worth buying. Yeah. Worthless right. junk in there. Right. 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 Little spacemen and little space toys that don't do anything at all. These little, these little cars that you see them in the commercials, they're supposed to be able to jump the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Turn the little motor on and let them go. And, and I got things like that. And you turn them on, they just spin around and around in a circle. You never could get them to do what they were supposed to do, according to what the commercials told you. You'd get mad and fuss and end up just stalling the thing against the tree. You'd be so mad at the thing. I did that more than once. With things that didn't work like they were supposed to. I'm sure that was the way they were supposed to work. That's why they didn't hardly cost anything. But the commercials told us otherwise. Look at all of these little men that will do all these things and will we'll walk back and forth like a robot and will talk to you. And those goofy things don't do anything at all. The point is, most of the gifts are worthless. Amen. Get them something they can use, like a pair of pants or a shirt that they can really use. I got stuck with that whenever I got older in life, and I found that to be very boring. I was satisfied with the high tide pants that made you look like you'd waded across the creek in order to get to school that morning. Until I got kidded about that. And then, <laughs> and then you find out, well, there's such thing as style. You know, you'd wear those pants that way up above the ankles. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. We call them high tides because it looked like you waded a creek to get to school that morning. And boy, just break your heart and embarrass you whenever people would kid you about that. What'd you do, you hillbilly? Did you have to walk across the creek to get here? <laughs> so I guess I started appreciating clothes that were long enough on the legs later on in life. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Anyway, it's a lie. It came out of Catholicism, and anything that's in Catholicism came out of Satan and demonism. So it's not enough to put our trust in. He wasn't born on that day. Don't get sentimental notions when December the 25th comes around. He wasn't born then. The church didn't even think of that for four centuries before the idea even came up. Well, this is some particular day. Whenever that day comes around, and of course I've been away from him for a number of years now, I don't think anything at all. I try my best. It's hard to do in America not to know when the 25th has come. And I've managed it before because my, the occupation I have, you can happen to be at home that day. And you just forget what day it is. Of course, if you have that day off from work, you know what day that is right away then. <laughs> you may want to be a good Christian martyr and just work that day anyway. So, <laughs> this day isn't anything at all. Give me the 27th off. I'll take the 27th off. I like the 27th. That's a good day to take off. I don't want the 25th off. I don't know. That might may be something to take into consideration. Just go and work. And if the place is locked up, just sweep the parking lot that day then. And, <laughs> and of course, people will be driving by. What's that fool doing? This is Christmas. You're not supposed to be working like that out there in the parking lot. Well, stay out of the stores whenever that time of year rolls around. Amen. You'll be run over by the religious herd there going after presents. <laughs> the people biting like vampires and foaming at the mouth, mad over someone taking their last toy. Like I said, you watch the average 411 clerk behind the counter and she's about to pull her hair out. <laughs> because of the floods of people, especially if it's that last minute maniac who waits until the 24th to get there. <laughs> like a terrible tooth child, just throws a fit. You know, hasn't been preparing themselves up until then. And, and you watch out on the 24th. That's, a, that's worse than the 25th. The 24th is a terrible day because people will beat a path over the top of you if you don't move in order to get to the store before it closes to get their gift. Most of the time, the gifts are already sold out around then, and that's when they really start foaming at the mouth. They really... They really get upset with everybody except themselves for forgetting they should have gotten there earlier. Again, does any of this have anything to do with the Bible? I don't even see anything related at all. You search in vain. Where's the connection between all of this religious nonsense? 
this pagan holiday self-centered nonsense where's the connection oh people need to preach some strong messages like we're doing tonight on the holiday and it would open some people's eyes about these things you can't just come on the scene and write in your little book about well this originated in catholicism so what so did a lot of other things and we still practice them the religious person would say you've got to point out all of the problems that are associated with this day and i guess besides um Besides the old lie of St. Nick, the problem of the presence has to be the biggest thing because of the confusion, the bitterness, the hatred, the jealousy, the envy, that, and just the plain down, out, and out headache, the migraine headache Amen. that the scene of having to buy presidents for 101 relatives, a lot of them you couldn't even pronounce their name if you tried to, <laughs> and yet you've got to send something to them to let them know that you're thinking of them during this time of year. You're not thinking of them, that's another lie. Amen. <laughs> Your mother reminded you of that great, great relative that you have. That's why you sent something to them. Again, you see nothing but things that are unchristian, lies, lies upon lies, hatred upon hatred. The self-centered life upon the self-centered life. And nothing at all to do with Jesus Christ, nothing at all to do with his birth, unless you sing away in the manger the night before Christmas at church. And you can hardly wait to get home. You can just hardly wait to get out of the religious system there and get home where you can have real fun. Because you know it's time to look at all the presents around the tree and you can hardly get a wink of sleep that night until the next morning comes. Well, that's not all we're going to say, but that's all we're going to say tonight.